This recording is from Fintech Nexus USA, formerly known as London Fintech USA, held at the Javits Center in New York City on May 25th to 26th, 2022. It's from the track Web3 and CBDCs, The Future of Money is Here, sponsored by NYDIG and is titled How Crypto Will Become the Financial System of the Internet. Speaking on the session are Ram Aluwalia from Layer Zero Wealth, Alex Mashinsky from Celsius, with moderator Helen Panzerino from Libeth. Financial system of the internet, that's our topic for today. And of course, uh, I will have the titans, the pioneers, the visionaries introduce themselves because I am here just as the moderator, as you said. So I'm coming from an education and a fintech perspective, but you guys are coming from much more than that in terms of the topic. And I would like to explore what we can learn from some of the recent things that have happened in this space and also regulation, the role of regulation and, and what the expectations are of regulation and what you see the outlook is. Because I think for something that has got the potential to include the 1 billion with phones of the 1.7 billion who are outside the financial services system as we know it, according to the World Bank, there's a potential power for all people uh, in, in this as the, the infrastructure. But then on the other side, we have the naysayers and the people who are running scared with regard to the volatility and the question about regulation. So as you explore whether or not this is the appropriate conduit and also the right time, are we very early in this space? That would be great. So if I can ask for introductions, Alex, please. I guess the people here are the people who survived the 2022 crash. Is that <laughs> a good definition? Uh, blood on the streets, huh? Uh, so Alex Mashinsky, I uh, usually show up in a t-shirt, but I do have an event right after this to get some prize, and they told me I do have to dress up. They told me don't show up in a t-shirt. So, <laughs> but my normal uniform is a hoodie and a, or a t-shirt. Uh, uh, so I'm a founder of eight startups, New York-based startups. Uh, many of you probably use it. Voice of IP, anyone here use Voice of IP? Right? WhatsApp or Skype or anything like that. New York subways, anyone uses the subways? I didn't invent the subways, but I did put five bars on your phone in the subways, transit wireless. So uh, uh, after the city, after arguing with the city for about seven years about that, uh, and uh, more recently started Celsius Network, which is a platform that allows you to do loans and earn yield. Also, you can do swaps, on-ramps. Uh, we're issuing a credit card. Uh, so we have about 2 million customers and about, uh, as of the prices right now, it's about 12 billion, but we were as high as 30 billion in assets under management. Uh, and what we do is really in the best interest of the community. So all the services we provide uh, are provided with no fees, no charges to the customer. We actually lend these assets to institutions, exchanges, charge them fees, and give the rewards to our community, right? So get take from the rich and give to the poor, you know? So maybe I'll change my name to Robin Hood. What do you guys think? Is that a good idea? I was just thinking. Because they don't do that. They, <laughs> they don't give their customers anything. It's just free trades. Uh, no, it's, it's a good observation on the crowd. If this was standing room only, then it would be December of this past year. And it would have been close to the top of the market. This is a good sign. Uh, so that's that's a positive. Are you calling a bottom? I'm not calling a bottom, actually. I'm definitely not calling a bottom now. Uh, we should do an audience poll on that if we have some time. That'd be great to do instant survey. We have time for that and for questions because I have a screen in front of me, which I promised to don my glasses to see. Terrific. I'll be brief. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Most recently, I founded the Cross River Crypto Business. Uh, we're a digital infrastructure bank that powers Coinbase, MoonPay, Sardine AI. We're behind the scenes. Uh, backed by uh, top-notch VCs like A16Z and Ribbit. You might have seen our IPO or our financing announcement in uh, in late March. Prior to that, I built a data analytics business called PRIQ, which is like a Bloomberg terminal for loans. I sold that to Cross River. Before that, I spent my career in what we call TradFi, so wealth management, uh, statistical arbitrage, anything with complexity, regulation, and innovation, I always find interesting. I focus there. Uh, I left Cross River to start a new business, which I'm not going to talk about today. So we're recruiting great people, though, so shoot me an email if you want to get involved on the ground floor or something exciting. 
So you know that the questions are going to be, I'm not going to talk about it, so let's talk about it, right? You left, you got, you left yourself wide open for that as well. Thank you very much. I said in that little bit of an introduction that there, obviously there's been market volatility in terms of uh, the, the, the size of the market capital, let's say for crypto, dropping from what, 3 trillion to 1.2 trillion. We saw Luna, uh, the UST implosion, Coinbase, there's lots of bad headlines. And just this morning, as I was scanning my Twitter feed or LinkedIn feed, the ECB, who can say this after the fact, came out saying it would be systemic disaster if you carry on with crypto and fiat. So crypto and banks getting involved and this should, this should stop, right? Which part? The fiat part should stop? <laughs> well, I did think it, it does lend weight to the discussion. You, you, you led right into that. You, you left the door <laughs> right. open. We should get on the blower to the ECB and say, oh, thank you very much, because actually now you make the argument for crypto. And this is a crowd that's savvy and understands what the construct is. There are still people, general people on the street saying, what is Web3? What is the infrastructure? How does all of this work? What is decentralized? Most people think about it in terms of financial inclusion, and then on the flip side, they see lots of bad news, or they see something from the regulator. The UK regulator is seesawing, he's going from one day to the other, starting to change his mind, Mr. Sunak as well, right? So all different, there's a lot of uncertainty around it. And I suppose my first question to both of you is, can we learn from what's happening now? And, and embedded in that is, is this the right time? Are people ready for this? So Alex, would you like to start? Well, I, I'm for actually, I'm only 20 years old. I just went through five crypto winters, so I look like this, you know, but uh, um, <clears throat> crypto goes through a, a stress test every year, sometimes twice a year. The financial system doesn't. The financial system goes through a, a spreadsheet-based stress test, and when uh, the music stops every 10 or 15 years, uh, we found out that we've all been swimming uh, naked, you know, like Warren Buffett says. So, so the problem we have is not that crypto is somehow causing all these problems. Crypto is here to fix a lot of the systemic problems that we're having in, in our financial system. And it, it, it's, we, I, the pendulum has swung to max centralization, and now it's swinging back towards max decentralization. So, so that's already happening. That is a... Uh, I don't think anyone, not Christine Lagarde and not anyone else can stop that. And I was in Lisbon, I was actually having breakfast in the hotel wearing a shirt that says banks are not your friends, right next to Christine Lagarde. And she was very upset that who allowed this anarchist to sit next to me in a fancy hotel and eat, eat breakfast together, you know? So that's how they view uh, decentralization, right? They view it as like this anarchists who are here to blow up the system, but really we're here to create something that does not need a bailout from the Fed, does not need a hand holding from the ECB, uh, does not need, uh, is not leverage 50 to one or whatever. So, so I just think, um, we, yes, we have to prove that, that we can uh, deliver on what we're promising. We meaning the crypto community and, and, uh, Luna is definitely not helping that. Uh, but uh, Luna is not representative of crypto. Luna is just one idea that didn't uh, work out. Uh, and, and the foundation of crypto, the foundation of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many of the other good projects are, are uh, uh, the future of finance. So there are, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. I'll start with the criticisms and then, and then negatives and then go to the positives. So first is, I think crypto, especially the anarcho-libertarian part of crypto, which is all for decentralization and no oversight, are relearning the lessons of the last 20 years and last two millennia, okay, around the role of banks, and learning why investor protection and consumer protection regulations exist. Uh, you have Mark Cuban, who bought a fraudulent NFT, and now he's saying, can someone help me? Can someone protect me? You're seeing people send transactions to wallets that are not compatible for their tokens. They lose their funds and no support desk or they lose their private keys and there's no recourse. You can't do anything. It's all on chain. It's an immutable transaction. Uh, you're also seeing bad actors. You're seeing fraud. It's fraud. A lot of the NFTs will go to zero, probably 98% of them. I would have said that. I did say that in January near the, near the bull. Maybe it's 98.5% today. By the way, I'm secularly bullish on crypto as I say all these things, okay? 
But there, there are a lot of lessons. Yeah, to I was be about learned. to kick you off the stage. For... No, I, like I'm, like I'm betting my future on crypto. I built a crypto business, so I'm, I've been in crypto for many years as well. Uh, but it is uh, not a sector for the for the faint of heart. You need a disciplined approach uh, and expertise. Otherwise, you can lose money. Like the, the rule number one of crypto, you know, is survive. That's if you talk to a crypto native. What's the number less number one rule in crypto is survive, and what that means is thinking about rug pulls or smart contracts that get hacked, uh, where you can lose your funds. Uh, now I'll move to the uh, the positive side, right? So we saw the fifty billion dollar destruction in value of Luna, which, by the way, is about the same amount as Lehman's failure. Lehman nearly brought down the financial system. Bank of America and J.P. Morgan were worth twenty billion dollars, which is half the value of Chime. It's extraordinary. However, Luna didn't create systemic risk. Why? Because there's no counterparty risk in crypto. Why? Because crypto is built on trustless systems. In TradFi, you have to trust your counterparty. You only see the financials quarterly, and sometimes people fudge the numbers. They handle accounting and accruals in different funny ways. So the fact that the system is trustless and is transparent on the blockchain uh, creates resiliency. So that's that's a positive. Uh, uh, I think there are other positives too. I think the, the lessons from the last few years who zoom out are one, stable coins have achieved product market fit. That's a big innovation. That was the promise of Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, electronic peer-to-peer cash, Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin didn't deliver on that because it's not used for payments because it's not stable, but stable coins have. We've learned algorithmic stable coins continue to fail. Uh, may, I, I'm not, maybe someone someday will come up with a, one that works. But reserve-backed currencies do work. Uh, the second area we've seen product market fit is around DeFi. DeFi works. MakerDAO worked. MakerDAO is like OG protocol, has a stable coin called DAI backed by collateral. That also works. So the system's been robust, it's been resilient. You also have use cases for the end market for consumers like NFTs. NFTs in January were about $60 billion and growing. It was bottoms up, community driven. Now you're seeing brands like Nike acquiring artifact. There are dozens of large public brands investing in NFTs to re-engage directly with the community in many different ways, by the way. Rethinking loyalty programs, rethinking how creators and artists are compensated and benefiting from uh, royalties from the secondary sale of their work and disintermediating the the producers and the distributors. So there's a lot of... uh, real-world innovation in crypto. And crypto is still a trillion-dollar-plus asset class, which means it's the fastest wealth-creating asset class and rate of adoption that we've seen in history. It took decades from Microsoft and Apple, Apple and Amazon to get to that kind of market cap. So it's generated enormous wealth, uh, and there's opportunities for more potential in crypto. Now, I think we can get to regulation more, but regulation is coming, regulation is here. I think that's that's one well, and, easy and, forecast. And actually, you raised a number of questions, and I know both of you, um, I, I think Alex Bitcoin for buying things, and I think you've heard you say on some of the videos I've watched, don't, don't use it for buying your coffee kind of thing, right? But I think also people assume when they hear crypto, not everyone here, but many people assume Bitcoin, so they're not thinking about stable coins, they're not thinking about other things. And the creator economy, I work with lots of creative people, and they've always had to monetize later or be cut out, and and, and even in that, you get the one, I, I made 300,000, I lost 300,000. Someone stole my M- NFT, it was me, and cut it up. I I do, I, I suppose internally I'm questioning whether the time is right. Is it too early for certain parts of it to, to launch wider? But also being clear about what kind of currency we're talking about and not buying your coffee with your Bitcoin. Um, but doing good or, or a Tesla <laughs> in in other ways, and then I guess my other question that's come out of this is around the trust and people who are looking to do things that are nefarious or untrustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. Because the general, as you've said, for decades we've grown up with regulation being the thing that gives us the trust in a system that has failed us, um, and we've had to bail out, you know, over time. But can we break that? Are we? Are we? Do we have work to do to to get people? understanding and trusting? Uh, To your point, right? Uh, Apple, no Apple, sorry. Microsoft, uh, zero to a trillion, 44 years. You can look it up. Google, zero to a trillion, 22 years. Bitcoin, zero to a trillion. 
44, 22, what's the next number? 11, look it up, 11 years, right? So so this is, this is and I'm, I'm writing a book about this, so don't steal it and quote it and say, hey, I invented this thing, okay? So I have 300 witnesses here, well, maybe maybe 90, but... <laughs> But the point is that there is Web 0, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3 are uh, evolutions. You know, they're, they're not, it, it, it's, it's not that somebody came up with Web 3 and we have to decide if it's a good idea or a bad idea, right? The, the way evolution works is in waves and we are in a wave. You want to join the wave, you don't want to join the wave, the tsunami is coming. You can't stop it, you can't do anything about it. So the future is already here. Do you want to grab the future or do you want to stay in the past? That's all you have to do. Now the fact you're in this room, you're already wet from the tsunami. I'm sure about that. So, but to grab the future, you have to let go of the past. You cannot grab the future and hold on to Web 2 at the same time. And that's the challenge we're having. When Christine Lagarde is saying, I'm not going to let these anarchists create Web 3 and, and have all the future all to themselves, She's saying, no, I want to, I'm comfortable in Web 2 and, and I cannot run the European Union and have the ECB and have my own currency if everybody can go and be their own bank and run their own uh, uh, payments and everything else. So, so I think there are, you know, I, I was at an event uh, downtown here on uh, Bowery uh, where there's a whole building dedicated to Web 3. All the companies there are Web 3. And it's full of 20-something-year-olds who don't even know the market crash. It's the Solana workspace, right? Yeah, yeah. So they could care less. They have no clue about any of the stuff we're talking about or we're worried about. Right? And they're there because they have passion to build the future, not because they're trying to be rich or, 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 or whatever. And they don't want to work for any of the big companies. Right? So that is the future. It's already there. Thank you. Regulation is coming. I think if you talk to the regulators, they'll say regulation's already here. They'll say there are existing statutes in the book that govern money movement, lending activity, how you safeguard customer funds, consumer protection, investor protection law. So the, the U.S. regulators are constructive on crypto. It's easy to, in the crypto world, to just point a finger and say they don't get it. They do get it. Um, I can tell you, I read the public comments of all the regulators very carefully. They are coordinated. And they'll say things like, hey, there's a lot of wealth here, one. Number two, China banned crypto, Russia's banned, and India is. Gee, there's an opportunity for international competitiveness here. Three, Silicon Valley's behind this. Can't we lead here globally? So that's their big picture view. However, they want to ensure that there's a level playing field. You can't have a regulated securities market governed by the SEC here, then have unregistered securities offerings to retail investors. Now, I'd like to abolish the credit investor rule. I'm not saying I agree with all the policies, I'm just saying that they are constructive. They are, they're actually very thoughtful about their approach. They don't want to kill the category. They want to ensure that laws are upheld. Now, I think one of the big things we'll see is continued movement of activity to banks. All roads go to banks. I saw that at Cross River as well as Gray's, like shooting fish in a barrel, doing business, you know, at Cross River, because everyone needs money movement. What is a stable coin? It's a money movement. What is DeFi? It's lending. What is metaverse? It's commercial real estate and single family residential. That's what banks finance. All the areas of product market fit, banks do it and they do it well and they do it carefully and they have regula regulatory oversight and they have a trusted relationship with the consumer. They also have a service layer, which is what crypto needs. So banks are the gateway to open up the market to mom and pop, to retail, to the boomer crowd that doesn't want to hold their keys, doesn't want to deal with MetaMask. Uh, and I think in the future, what you're going to see is crypto is the back end, and we're going to get the familiar uh, consumer experiences that we have from technology firms today. And more regulation is coming. I think Stable Act gets passed. I think stable coins will have to be issued by banks. Um, and I think there'll be more regulation of crypto neobanks. So you have crypto neobanks that are offering deposits to customers paying out a short-term interest rate, but they're taking the deposits and doing prop trading, uh, and they're not being compensated for the risk. You're taking serious equity risk for a fixed income-like return. That's not sustainable. I think that will get regulated as well. Alex, on regulation, and obviously Christine Lagarde is not playing the game. We know, we know this. She's maybe a bit protective as well of her domain. 
You've got a view, but is is and I mentioned the UK. Well, look, uh, all these laws were written in 1940, and and we can't go and you know when the cop gives you a ticket, do you argue with him over changing the law, or you just saying, okay, you want to change the law about parking on the streets, you got to go to the lawmakers, not to the cop who's enforcing the rules, right? So our issues are the laws, not uh, is, is the SEC doing their job, is the CFTC doing, yes, they're doing their job. These are the laws that they're enforcing. They're, they're interpreting more broadly or less broadly. Though you can take that to court and argue with about the definition, but that's not the issue. The issue is that we're about 100 years overdue for uh, new regulation that that takes in mind Web 3.0. Now, again, the United States invented, we invented Web Zero, right? Web Zero, uh, you know, 0, 0.0, and then Web 1.0, right? And then Web 2.0. We were the leader in all of that, and now we have to decide, do we want to be the leaders in Web 3.0, or do we want somebody else to do it? I, I was in Portugal, uh, you know, they have no, like, there's no taxes, you can do whatever you want, there's a sandbox, you basically get indemnification, you can test anything you want, and this is Portugal, right? So, so, so I think we as the, the world's envy, right, we, we, everybody's envious of, of our position, the reserve currency, the largest economy, the most diverse, uh, um, you know, collective of people on the planet, right? Uh, uh, we, we should own this, right? So, so let's come up with a new set of laws that are really gonna allow innovation to stay here. When I, when I was building Voice of IP in 1994, you know, uh, I went, I, w I was testifying in front of Congress, I know I was like 20 something, and, and uh, they passed the law in 1996, they passed the law that told all the phone companies, you have no rights. You, you have no right to stop this crazy guy, Mashinsky, from putting voice over your phone lines, over, over your data lines. You never received a monopoly and you should treat everybody equally, right? And, and that set of laws that, that, that gave equal access uh, really changed everything, right? And so we need the equivalent to that in the financial system. Now, the, the financial companies have a True, the largest lobby, right? They have billions of dollars a year that they made, they spend to make sure that nothing like this ever passes. And that's what we're facing. We're not fighting with the lawmakers. We're really fighting with the banking lobby. Yeah, look, I'd say if you're a retail investor in crypto. Now that you're not a banker anymore. Like, I'm, you don't work for a bank. I'm an I'm a entrepreneur trying to change the banking system from within, kind of red pill from within. But it's if you're a retail investor, the odds are stacked against you. It's really hard. Look, there are folks on Telegram groups that have insider information on the latest protocol on when it's released. They can look at the blockchain, see the next mint, and front run the mint. Right? You can. Uh, you have VCs that can get warrants to buy tokens before the launch, uh, and the retail investors are pumping the tokens. So it's very, very hard now. I think it's extraordinary innovation. By the way, part of that's driven by regulation, by the way. Regulation forces the funding model to be driven by VCs because ICOs are illegal. So it's a funny, regulation needs to be fixed. That said, you gotta balance consumer protection uh, and, and investor protection. And actually, listen to both of you, when I think about this and speaking to people in the European Union, it's like putting old clothes on a new body. <laughs> it's, it's, it's never going to fit. Nothing's ever going to fit, right? It, but to, to jettison it and to start again seems to be a big, big step forward. And I imagine in two years or three years' time, we'll be sitting here five years' time, and this won't be part of the conversation because it will. the wave will have turned into more of a tsunami. Well, a quarter of Americans have crypto, so if you want to get reelected. You're a lawmaker and you want to get reelected, and you say uh, bad things about Bitcoin, you're not going to get reelected. And yeah, the opposite is true also. If, you're, true. if you, you want to get elected mayor of New York, just say Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. You're done. There are tens you know? of thousands of DECA Bitcoin millionaires that are going to be one issue voters and they're going to fund campaigns and they could make a margin of difference one or two points in elections like Florida, just swing state. So I totally agree. Imagine a DAO for like, DAO political action committees. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, I, think, I think you're going to see political influence. I, I totally agree. Look, I think another positive of this washout over the last few months, uh, no, I don't think it's, uh, there's some good questions coming in there, but is that you're going to shift from speculation, which is what a lot of this crypto activity has been about. It's like pumping quick 
you know, get rich quick stuff, right? To building again and delivering value on end consumer and end commercial use cases like NFTs and digital art and putting real estate on the blockchain, uh, you know, disintermediating uh, c- uh, counterparty risk by putting things on smart contracts. There's real value creation there that makes the system uh, more robust and creates more value to consumers. You know, Twitter should be decentralized, right? There's a lot of things you can do around that. So that's what the next one to two years is about. It's about the build phase. And I think that people can grasp that as a, as a use case, right? I think, and if it, it makes sense, it's efficient, it's cost efficient, it's a trusted place. Who's the, who's the identity? What's the currency? What's the actual digital asset? And what's the infrastructure that is still potentially being built by the guys down downtown? And the mayor was here this morning telling us to spend, spend, spend while we're in New York. So everybody has to get spending as well, says the native New Yorker who lives abroad. So I'll go with that. There are some questions. So, and hopefully my glasses will help. What is your opinion on, I say Binance, some people say Binance, USD stablecoin? No opinion. Stick to USDC. Well, it, it's issued by, uh, I think, by Pax, uh, Paxos, right? So BUSD is issued by uh, a company that has 96% in cash and 4% in U.S. treasuries. So, so it's as good as... Uh, uh, USDP or as uh, USDC in my view. So, again, not investment advice, but uh, it's not issued by Binance, right? So it's not a you, your counterparty is not Binance. You are you can go to Paxos and redeem 100% at any time. And by the way, it's very important to understand that uh, I know many people think that the USDT or Tether depegged. It did not depeg because just because a willing seller and a willing buyer transacted at 95 cents doesn't mean that the guy who bought it at 95 cents didn't turn around, go to Tether, and got a full dollar for it. So $11 billion were redeemed from Tether, and all of those were redeemed at 100 cents on the dollar. So it's just a shame that a lot of people on who are you know, re- reading the FUD on, on, on Twitter decided to sell for less than a dollar. So Anonymous, thank you very much. Will there be further fallout from the Terra Luna crash. Yeah, there's, there's more to come. So a lot, of, uh, there are a lot of venture funds and private funds that probably are net negative equity because they had a bunch of Luna. And that won't be revealed until they give the quarterly statements to their limited partners. And limited partners look at them and they say, what? We lost money? I'm going to redeem? Or the fund's going to fold because they're so underwater? Uh, and that'll cost some more selling. Uh, but I think you'll have you know fewer experiments in, in algorithmic stable coins, which are super intellectually interesting. But and I've tracked them all, but unfortunately they've they've all failed. So uh, stablecoin comes in three different forms, right? One is fully backed, like uh, Paxos or USDC, one to one with the US dollars, right? One, uh, one group is over uh, uh, collateralized. Uh, Dai and USDT are over collateralized. And you have to see what is the collateral. So DAI is over collateralized with wrap Bitcoin and the Tether uh, and ETH, sorry, right? And then you have Tether, which is over collateralized with gold and uh, all kind of other uh, real assets, right? Uh, uh, commercial paper and all kind of other things that we just don't know what it's made out of. And then you have a third group, which is people just call themselves a stablecoin, right? So. I can call myself the president of the United States. You're gonna know immediately that that's not true. But just because somebody says they are a stable coin doesn't mean you have to trust them. So, so it doesn't matter if it's algorithmic or not algorithmic. And the point is what is behind it, right? And if, if what's behind it is 10 times more volatile than Bitcoin itself, which is 80 vol, you should not touch that, right? That is the issue. So, so it's, it's Luna, Look, the good news about Luna is what you said before, is that UST and Luna was its own little universe. And it's not like Lehman or Bear Stearns where the dominoes are going to fall and every company in crypto is going to be taken out. It's only those two assets and the people who trusted that uh, group of assets uh, that got hurt. Now, a lot of people got hurt, right? Celsius wasn't part of it. I know there was fudding in the news that we helped Terra, issued loans to them or whatever. We didn't do anything like that. But the point is, is that the people who did participate in that game, I know several funds who thought that the peg is going to come back, so they bought it at 20 cents and 40 cents and so on. A lot of that hasn't come out yet, as you said. I would love if we could get more transparency on the neobank level. So at the blockchain level, you have full transparency, right? 
at the there's a layer above that that delivers crypto to the end consumer. Coinbase is an example of that, right? Your company is an example of that. Uh, Nexo Mutual, BlockFi, but we don't have transparency into assets and liabilities. It's like on Twitter, for example, there's a lot of fud around. Hey, can I access my funds? What I'd love to see is you, having these CFI companies publish their assets and liabilities on chain in real time, like live the ethos of crypto, create accountability, and that should inspire confidence. So that already exists. So, for example, we have proof of reserves with Chainlink. Proof of us earning the yield, right? It's called we pro, we call it the uh, rewarded explorer, where you can go on the blockchain and verify that we issued loans, we received the payment, and that you got your pro rata yield out of that payment. So all of that already exists. Can I see all the liabilities, all the loans that are made, the counterparties that you're lending yeah, to? It's it's done with zero proof knowledge, the ZK uh, rollups. Okay. But yes, you can verify cryptographically that what we're telling you is. Uh, authenticated so you can validate by the blockchain. That the so, liabilities have a stated value. That it's a number. It's not. Look means, again. Right. It's not an audit. It's it's more about proving. Like the, the problem that most people don't understand is that when you earn yield or what they call yield on uh, Cardano or on some other project, it's not yeah. yield. It's just inflation. They're taking tokens that they have in treasury and they're giving them to you, and you're saying, "Wow." Look, so, I've earned 11%. You didn't earn anything. I, they printed, uh, their inflation is 18%. I, I love the proof of reserve concept. I think there's more to be done there. Look, there so are- So my point is, but my point yeah. is Celsius doesn't print more tokens. When we say we earn right. something, somebody actually paid us, made us a payment. Right. Right. So, right. so there's a big difference between, in this case, there's only two companies that do that, BNB, uh, which is uh, Binance and Celsius, right? Everybody else just mints token and throws uh, them you, on you so, and you think you're getting rich. So one of the things we did at CrossRiver is we would underwrite loans to these fintechs. So I learned one or two things am examining their books. And I would find these fintechs, you know, again, they have to get achieved their growth numbers to justify the next round of VC funding. So there's that, that dynamic at play, right? They're making unsecured loans to prop trading firms. Like, what the heck is going on here? There's a, you know, there's a reason why the Volcker rule was passed to protect customer deposits from taking prop trading risk. So that's a risk factor. I think a lot of folks that are seeking yield, putting deposits, realize it's not FDIC insured. It not, it's not may lose value, right? You've seen that. It, it's will lose value at some point in time. There could be firm, you know, so I think there are a lot of, I, I'd, I'd welcome more transparency around that. On the Web3 front, the area I'm most excited about is crypto blockchain gaming. This is not financial advice. By the way, whenever someone says not financial advice, they're about to give you financial advice. <laughs> but this is really not financial advice, okay? Uh, so crypto blockchain gaming is phenomenal. I think you're going to see a lot of pickup on that in the next year, in one to two years because you're going to get more investment in, in uh, L2 infrastructure that creates more speed and velocity. So what does that mean? So if you're a crypto blockchain game, you're getting equity value for your accomplishments and your time spent on developing an avatar or cultivating a farm or you know you you won the battle axe from some kind of mission that has value uh, look at we're already in the metaverse it's zoom you know if you have kids they're already on roblox or they're on what fortnite so we're already there and i think once a consumer sees that when they turn off their laptop and world of warcraft goes away they delete the game, well, that value is gone, but now they can crystallize it and capture it in a property, right, that's transferable. I think that is a one-way door. You know, convenience and value creation around that, I think, is to me, right? So crypto blockchain gaming, I think, is a is a great area to focus on. Yeah, to add to that, so um, uh, the first wave, right, Satoshi comes and invents, uh, uh, again, the, like you said, the, the title of the white paper is uh, peer-to-peer cash system, right? Uh, so even Satoshi doesn't think that he or she, right, doesn't think that this is a store of value platform. But it turns out that uh, really what, what most people are looking for is just a, a store of value that is not attached to the U.S. dollar or to fiat currencies, right, because of all the money printing and, and debasement that's going on. Uh, the second application is smart contract, right? So Vitalik, I don't know if you guys know, Vitalik was the editor of Bitcoin magazine. He, he gave the code for free, went to the Bitcoin Association and said, here's my smart contract, just incorporate this in the, uh, in the Bitcoin code, right? Just add it to what Satoshi already wrote. And people look at him and say, what, are you crazy? We, we can't touch Satoshi's. That's like the First Amendment. We can't we can play with that. That's perfect. 
So he goes and creates a, a fork or derivative of Bitcoin, which is Ethereum, that has a smart contract. And the use case there is that you can create all of these derivatives and applications and lending and other things, right? And and the third the third wave was again what, what Celsius started, which was yield, right? Suddenly we discovered that all these assets can pay yield. Why? Because Wall Street generates yield. Right? JP Morgan just told you they made 60 billion in, in the net interest margin. They made it on your money. They just didn't give it to you. They're bragging about it to their shareholders. Right? But here you can create yield and give it to the people who actually contributed the assets, not the people who are managing the assets. And that's the where the revolution is. The revolution is not about are you doing it safely or not? We can manage all of that with new laws. The revolution is who gets the benefit. In a decentralized world, we all benefit. We all get together, we create a DAO, or we create a smart contract or something else, and we rip the benefits versus the banks decide that we earn 0% while they're doing loans on the credit card and charging all of us 24%, right? Why aren't we getting part of that 24%? They're risking, they're giving you a credit limit with, with your neighbor's money, right? So those are the things that we, because we all have in one-on-one -on -one relationship with the bank, we cannot disrupt it. We, we didn't get together and, and say, no mas, you know, we're not going to do this anymore. I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to do this anymore. That's what I did. I just said, I'm mad as hell and two million people show up and say, we're with you. Is there room on a bus? Let's get together. Let's do it. So, so now we, we've paid close to a billion dollars to almost two million people charging institutions fees. They hate paying us fees every month. They're like, can we get rid of these Celsius guys? No, you can't, okay? Because no one else is gonna give you Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else for these loans that you need, right? For hedging and market making and all the other shenanigans that they do to make money. If I, 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 I'm, and I'm just getting I, started. I was just going to say, I can feel it. And I'm thinking about my voice. Where's my t-shirt? <laughs> you need to change as well. I, I want to be part of the revolution now. I, and I just a couple more questions. I know we're going to run with people. For Alex, what type of stable coin will ultimately succeed in your opinion and why? I think you've dealt with the hockey stick side of the other Web3. Well, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I, I think the US will mandate that only banks can issue it. We're seeing it already. Facebook tried, right? Uh, uh, and uh, Silvergate basically bought what's left from that and they're a bank and they're gonna be really issuing something like DM or whatever. So, and I think and the, the problem is that the, we already went through this experiment in the 1700s where every bank issued their own dollar mm -hmm. and it didn't end well, right? So, so I don't think the Fed or Treasury want to experiment through that again. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing thing for the United States to extend and create a digital dollar. The velocity of money, right, on the blockchain is 22. Do you know what the velocity of the dollar in the U.S. economy is? 1.2. So, it, and, and, and that, when the Fed is saying, or Treasury is saying, we want GDP, we want this, they're talking about the velocity of money. That's what they're talking about, right? So, it's already there. You don't have to do anything. You just have to let Web3 uh, take dollars, turn them into, uh, the dollar is already digital, but we need to turn it to be on a blockchain, right? And let it loose. Just let it do what it's doing already, right? And, and basically shift the power from centralized bank to decentralized institutions that act in our best interest. I it's very simple. I was just going to say the simplicity of what you just said is really striking because they just don't want to listen to me. It, it, if people try to make it complicated, hey, out there! As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking that's really straightforward. I can't help but thinking behind it, there's some power thing going on with other people that want to continue to control. It's us. an invisible hand behind the curtain. Yeah, right. They're over there. It's yes. not. It's not that nefarious. You know, behind closed doors, regulators open up. They're human beings and U.S. citizens just like us. They care about uh, a stable foundation, encouraging responsible growth, protecting consumers and investors. That's but it's they don't really, wear t-shirts and enforcing the law. That's it. That's what they're doing. It's not a. It's not anything more than that. 
Well, I think we there is a revolution. It is coming. I feel I feel it's now here. It's, it's here already. It's here. it's here. It's expanding. We need to get the web three bit sorted out. The regulators need to kind of realize that we can't be using old things now and that other things haven't worked. And I feel I feel the regulators just need or the lawmakers just need to talk to their children. Okay, that's really what's missing. I was just going to say you know? the next generation. You mentioned boomers before, which I sit in, but I think the generation that's coming up is. This will be just like having a drink of water for them, and so it has to, it has to change as well. Thank you both very much. Thank you. I think we Thank all, you guys. we're all off to the party for more questions.